we're going to get started again. You're at, I got. Uh, you're at Taylor right. Center? At uh, Sunset. At Sunset. Oh, yeah. I'll yeah. talk to you about that after. So All right. I grew up in that area. Okay. All right. If you don't want Belleville. I do. I was just there on Thursday. There's a little shop there that one of our members owns. And it was Valentine's Day, and I, I thought that's where I need to go to shop. So, um, in uh, in Belleville, if you ever get down to Belleville, there's a great little shop called Crafted, uh, Crafted Modern Homemade. I think is the name of it. But anyway, um, great great folks run that, and um, great ideas for that in Belleville. So. Anyway, throw that out there. Um, I want you to turn to Romans chapter 6. We're going to get there in a moment. Um, as, as we look at the idea of obeying the gospel and um, had some great conversations up here in between, um, talking about different things that, um, that we really uh, maybe overlook sometimes, uh, and especially are overlooked within a denominational setting. Um, was talking with Chuck and Ted, we were talking about Ed Wharton and what a difference he's made in our lives. Um, I mean, Ed is my mentor, uh, has been since I went to school. In fact, I was telling Chuck that um, we had dinner with Truett and Kay and Ed and Martha uh, before we moved to Lubbock, before we even enrolled in school. And we're sitting at the dinner table and, and I asked Ed, I said, um, I said, if I decide to come to school here, would you mentor me? And um, he got all excited, and, um, and so uh, so he did. And and so Ed is um, Ed has he has played a a prominent role in in me becoming a Christian, but only because Stan sent me the video cassettes of the distinctive nature of the church. Um, Stan sent me those video cassettes. That tells you how long ago it was. Okay, we're talking 2000, a little before DVDs and Blu-ray hadn't even been thought of. But so here I am preaching in the United Methodist Church in the living room or family room in the Methodist parsonage with the video cassettes, notebooks, pens, pencils, highlighters, Bibles, everything I could get a hold of, remote control to pause and rewind, studying the distinctive nature of the church as I sat there in the Methodist parsonage. And, um, and so when I first met Ed uh, at one of the workshops, I introduced myself and I told him, I said, you don't know me, you've never met me, but I'm a Christian today in large part because of you. And um, you know, his eyes watered up. And, but when Stan sent me those video cassettes, it was like, for the first time in my life, the book of Acts made sense. And that's what we were studying in the Methodist church when I started to get so frustrated. Because I thought, well, what we're doing in the Methodist church is not what I'm reading in the book of Acts. And I thought, there's got to be, I mean, the, the church that I see in Acts has to, has to be somewhere. I didn't know where it was. And so then on, in May of 2000, uh, I'm at a preacher's conference, pastor's conference is what it's called, uh, in Northeast Ohio. And I'm sitting at a table just like you guys are, and I come in and I sit down and, you know, all these preachers are walking in and I'm just looking around. There's an empty seat next to me, and in walks Reggie White. Anybody know who Reggie White is? <laughs> He was a football player. He was known as the Minister of Defense for the Green Bay Packers. Um, legendary. And Hall of Famer. And um, he's since died. Um, but after he retired from football, he went into preaching. And he was at this uh, conference, not as a speaker or guest or anything. He was there as a participant, just like me. And so I got all excited because there's an empty seat sitting right next to me. And I thought, this one's for Reggie. Reggie's going to sit right there. And so I'm looking and he's wandering in, meandering. And from the other side, this little guy with a comb over hairdo 
comes up and asks, is this seat taken? And I really wanted to say, yes, Reggie's sitting there. But I said, no, it's empty. And so he sat down there. And um, God's providence at work, Amen. I believe. And, uh, and so, and then during the course of our study, that was May of 2000, during that summer is when Stan had sent me the distinctive nature of the church. And I'm telling you, I mean, it was light bulb going off every, every lesson I watched on that. And, uh, and it was incredible. And one of, the, one of the topics in there, and one of the things that Stan and I talked a lot about was obeying the gospel. Because that was a concept foreign to me. We didn't, we didn't talk about obeying the gospel. We, talk, we heard the word gospel, but I couldn't tell you what was taught about it. But when it came to obeying the gospel, I thought, well, that's interesting. I mean, how in the world do you do that? And so, when we understand what the gospel is, when we get a biblical definition, a working definition of the gospel, the good news that God uses to call us into fellowship with Himself, how do we obey that? If we identify the gospel like Paul does, 1 Corinthians 15, that it's the death, the burial, and resurrection of Jesus, and please don't leave out the appearances, because those are incredibly important. It's the death, the burial, the resurrection, and the appearances of Jesus that Paul points out are of first importance. When you talk about that, okay, if that's the gospel, how do I obey that? Well, I mean, what do you do with that? All right, well, I guess I, I, that, gives, that gave new meaning to me what it meant to take up your cross. Because I thought I was going to have to do that. He died. I guess I'm going to have to die. So I better take up my cross. Somebody get some nails. How do we do that? How do we answer God's call through the gospel? In 1 Thessalonians chapter 1, there's a passage that Stan pointed out to me that kind of... I guess it kind of shocked me. Um, 2 Thessalonians chapter 1. It's really in verse 8. 2 Thessalonians 1 and verse 8. Stan pointed this out. There's another passage as well um, in 1 Peter 4, 17. Stan, he said, read this. I said, okay. He says, it says uh, that God is dealing out retribution to those who do not know God and who do not obey the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ. Hmm. Well, now it went from wondering how to obey the gospel to absolute fear of not doing it. So if I don't do it, I face God's wrath. So I better figure this out. What did you think when you read it? How did you, what, oh. Well, it stunned me. Um, I thought, because I didn't know what obeying it was. I, I didn't know how to do that. I didn't, and so if I don't know how to do it, how can I do it? If I don't do it, then I've got God's retribution. God's wrath, His punishment, His justice. Now, okay, now what? I, in hindsight, I can apply that to Acts 2.36. I mean, uh, 37, where they were pricked in the heart. In hind, I didn't know that then. But in hindsight, I look back and I say, hey, maybe that's where I was pricked in the heart. And there's another passage we'll look at as well. But then in 1 Peter chapter 4, and in verse 17, Peter says, For it is time for judgment to begin with the household of God. Time for judgment to begin. 
And if it begins with us first, what will be the outcome for those who do not obey the gospel of God? Okay, not only do I realize that I've not obeyed the gospel, I don't even know how. I don't know what that means. Because it had never been taught to me before. I say that to say that that's probably a topic. If you're talking with somebody within denominations, in, in, den in the denominational world, you're going to open their eyes to something that they've never considered before. Now, I know that because I've talked about this with my own family and um, who are, they're still part of the denominational world. Um, <coughs> And, uh, and so I've asked them about that. And, um, and so, you know, it all gets into this idea of saved by faith, faith only. Okay. And we're going to talk about that in a moment because you have to have an obedient faith. Faith, faith has to be objective. It can't simply be subjective. It can't be based on feelings or opinions or different ideologies. Faith has an object. I mean, Romans chapter 10, verse 17, if it tells us anything, it tells us that faith has an object. If faith is objective, faith comes by feeling and feeling through your experience. That's not what it says. Oh, it comes by hearing and hearing what the preacher says in the pulpit. No. You guys know what it says. Faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. It's objective. Faith is based upon this book right here. And so, um, so when we talk about obeying the gospel and, and the idea that God is going to deal out retribution, that the judgment of God is upon those who do not obey the gospel, we need to move from believing the gospel to obeying the gospel. Now, we've, we've all moved in that area. We need to bring others along. We need to help them see what that means. Because their judgment depends upon it. Their eternity depends upon it. Um, and so what does it mean to obey the gospel? Do we want to experience God's retribution? His wrath, His punishment, His vengeance? We've got to know God... And we've got to obey the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ. Jesus says in John chapter 17 and verse 3, this is eternal life. Knowing you, the only true God, and your Son whom you have sent. Jesus says that's eternal life. We've got to know God. And then we have to obey His gospel. That's where faith comes in. Faith comes in our obedience. Faith is not... You cannot have faith apart from obedience. If you do, it's just belief. Is there a difference between believing and having faith? Here's a question. I don't know where this is in my notes, but here's the question. Can you believe in God and not have faith? A lot of people do. Satan does. Satan does. I think you came up here just so you could peek at my notes, didn't you? <laughs> <clears throat> he does. Um, and, and many people have. There, and there's examples in our Bibles. So when we look at, at obeying the gospel and putting our faith into action and really exercising our faith... Um, there, there's a choice that has to be made. So when it comes to obeying the gospel, you've got to make a choice. You have to choose to do that. Paul had to choose to do that. You guys remember what Ananias told him? What are you waiting for? Arise and be baptized and wash away your sins, calling on the name of the Lord. That's a loaded statement that gives a lot of explanation to what baptism is and what happens there. But Paul had to choose to get up. Ananias told him to do that, 
I get the idea they're sitting across a table like we are, and Paul's just sitting there, just, okay, they're studying the Bible together. Well, I don't know about all that. You imagine it how you do. And, and Ananias and Paul sitting there having this discussion. And Ananias just looking at Paul saying, what are you waiting for? Why tarriest thou? You got any King James folks, American Standard folks? I'll right, tell you a funny story. Don't count this against my time. <laughs> Before I left Fresno to move to Lubbock and go to school, we had Ed out for a meeting. And uh, I, w I had been studying with a guy for a couple of years, although he didn't want to sit down across a table from me. I couldn't get him to do that. But we got him coming to church almost every Sunday. But he had a golf league that also played on Sundays, and so sometimes he was with the guys golfing. His wife was a Christian. She hadn't been faithful in a long time, but she came back. She came forward one Sunday, asked the church to forgive her, and we did. We brought her back in, and her husband would come once in a great while. And he was there one time, and I went, I always stood by the center door. That's where the preacher's supposed to be, right? And uh, what's that? Gospel. Gospel. That's gospel. <laughs> and, uh, and so he was there, and, and uh, he always, I mean, he was like one of the first ones out. As soon as amen, he's already at the door. You wonder how he got there so quick. And, uh, and so I thought, okay, next time I'm going to that door. So I go to that door, and I meet Herb, and, um, and we start talking, and we start talking about golf and all of that. And, um, and I asked him, I said, have you ever studied the Bible? No, no. He said, he said, you know, Dana talks about it. That's his wife's name. And uh, he said, that's as much as I've done. And, uh, and I said, well, you know, I said, we could study together if you'd like. I'd, you know, I'd love to, you know, open up your eyes and, you know, allow you to see some things that she's already seen. And uh, he, uh, he said, maybe sometime, maybe sometime. So eventually he asked me to play golf with him. And uh, he was a member at one of the elite clubs in town, Fort Washington. Um, and that was something special. And I thought, man, I'm going to get to play the fort. And I thought, man, this is, oh, wow, I'm going to go do that. So he wouldn't sit across the table from me and study for an hour, but we'd play golf together for four or five hours. And I thought, aha, I could do this. And um, I tried to get the elders to buy me a membership to the country club. <laughs> As I said, <laughs> I, with, with his game, I don't think you have to worry about it. Uh, so I thought, I, you know, this is, this is cool. So not, we did this for two years. All right. And about the last six months I was in Fresno, Herb comes up to me and he says, we need to talk. And I said, what about? He said, we need to talk about being baptized. And I said, you got it. He said, meet me at the fort. Whatever day it was, we'll have lunch. I said, okay. I was really disappointed because that's all we did was had lunch. <laughs> and we didn't play. And, um, and so we started studying a little more in depth and a little more detailed. And he was getting it. He understood what it was. Ed comes out for this meeting right before I left. Herb was the last guy I baptized in Fresno. I took Herb and Ed out to get, um, just to get some refreshments after the session that night, let Herb get to know Ed a little bit. And um, we're sitting there at the table at a restaurant called Mimi's. We're talking about the studies we've had and Herb is describing what he understands now about the gospel. And, about the church and that. Ed leans across the table, looks at Herb, and he says, Herb, why tarriest thou? And I just cringed. <laughs> I thought, he didn't say it like that, did he? I'm like, what are you waiting for to be all right? Why tarriest thou? Ed is American standard all the way. And Herb said, I don't know. And Ed looked at him again, and he said, Arise and be baptized, and wash away your sins, calling on the name of the Lord. And Herb said, I need to do that. I look over at Ed, 
and I'm thinking in my mind, I've been studying with him for months, and that's all you got to do? Ed would always tell us, Terry, you vouch for me. Say what the Bible says and operate on what you know. That's, I mean, that was Ed's tagline. And that's what he did. So I asked Herb, I said, well, do you want to wait for Dana to come back into town? She was out of town for a week visiting family. He said, no. He said, he said I need to do this now. We got up. Check, please. We headed back to the church building and baptized him into Christ. Because Ed said, why tarriest thou? And, uh, and I thought, man, that guy, he knew, but in my young Christian walk, I didn't, I couldn't get him that far. I don't know how long it would have taken. And I was leaving town. So was that the end of your call? <laughs> uh, well, kind of, because I moved to, to Lubbock. Uh, and so we moved away. But, um, but I st I'm still in contact with him. He's... He started in their satellite school after that and really became grounded in that. But he came to understand what it meant to obey the gospel. And that's really, that's really what we have to, to think about. He knew that there was a choice that needed to be made. He was ready to make that choice. He knew that obedience is always a matter of our will. Was listening to... Um, Brother John DeBerry, um, you guys may know him. Carrie knows him really well. That's how I got to know him. Um, we had John DeBerry come out to uh, Corona in January. <clears throat> so I set it all up and then left. And I didn't get to hear him, but I was watching online. And he was making the statement that God will not save somebody who doesn't want to be saved. God will not save you without your consent. God will not save you without your participation. And I thought, wow, that's so true. Smacks in the face of predestination. <laughs> you know, talk to the Presbyterians about that. But that's true of God. If you're not a willing party, it's a matter of our will. It's God's will that we be saved. I mean, that's uh, what Peter, he says in, sec, what is it, 2 Peter 3, 9. Somebody check me out on that. God is not slow as some count slowness, but he's patient toward us, not, what, not wanting any to perish, but all to come to repentance. It's God's will for everybody to come to repentance. Peter would say in Acts 2, repent and let every one of you be baptized. That's God's will for everybody, but our will has to sync with God's will. And obedience is always a matter of our will. Whether it's being baptized or whether it's walking by faith, it's always a matter of our will. Our obedience. It, whether it's in our marriage, whether it's raising our children, whether it's in our finances, whether it's in our service in the Lord's church, our obedience is always a matter of will. Our will. But it's also a matter of our devotion and how, how close we are with God and how, how strongly we desire to follow Him, to take up that cross. And obedience is always a matter of our faith. Do we really trust Him enough to do what He wants us to do and to be what He wants us to be? So how do you obey the gospel? Romans chapter 6. Well, I told you to turn there a long time ago. <clears throat> Are you there yet? Let me tell you that um, this is the passage that turned my world upside down. Okay? Now, if it, if it wasn't the obeying the gospel, the retribution, the judgment, the punishment, the vengeance, the wrath, if that all didn't do it, this is, this is verse 5 right here. Romans 6 verse 5 is what knocked me off my, off my feet. Because in Romans chapter 6, first of all, we're told in verses 16, 16 through 18 that we present ourselves as slaves of righteousness. Okay? So take these passages and use them with folks who are in a different setting 
than are we who maybe worship in a different way. Um, and, and let me say this. Chuck and I were talking about this. Man, I'm really getting to love this guy. Um, he, I knew someday he would come. He, he knew someday somebody would, right? Somebody would love him someday. Um, but don't, don't focus on all of the peripheral things. Don't, don't focus on getting somebody's worship right without obeying the gospel. Because without obeying the gospel, right worship doesn't mean anything anyway. I mean, listen, we know this to be true because we probably have folks in our own congregations who sit in the pews week after week, who bow their heads when we pray, who sing along when we sing, who eat the Lord's Supper when we eat, who listen to the preaching, who may even put contributions in the plate. And they're still outside of Christ. So just because... We think we do those things right. That doesn't mean we're saved. Certainly doesn't mean we're in Christ. So you can fix somebody's pattern of worship and their pattern of church thinking, the structure of the church. You can fix all of that stuff. And they can still be outside of Christ. They can still be uh, subject to the wrath and the judgment of God and His punishment. So we need to, to help people present themselves as a slave of obedience. Look at verse 16. Do you not know that when you present yourselves to someone as slaves for obedience, you are slaves of the one whom you obey, either of sin resulting in death or of obedience resulting in righteousness? So if you're talking with somebody, ask them whose slave you are. Just from that text. Whose slave are you? Because you are the one that make yourself the slave. That's what Paul just said. Nobody made you the slave. You did. You're either a slave of sin or you're a slave of obedience that results in righteousness. And then he says in verse 17, But thanks be to God that though you were slaves of sin... Now, he talks about their past. You were slaves of sin. He says, you became obedient from the heart to that form of teaching, that form, that pattern of teaching to which you have become committed. And having been set free from sin, you become slaves of righteousness. So he talks about their past and he talks about their present. He says, this is what you were. You were a slave of sin. This is what you did. You obeyed from the heart a pattern of teaching. Now, this was another new concept that was new to me, this pattern stuff, pattern theology. And what I'm learning after almost 20 years in the Lord's church, that some people don't like that talk. There are some among our brotherhood that don't like pattern theology because it's too confining it's, it limits us. It, um, it's too narrow, yes. You cannot read the Bible and get away from pattern thinking. That's the way Paul thought. And that's the way he presented it. You obeyed from the heart this pattern of teaching. He says, this is what you were, this is what you've done, and this is what you've become, a slave of righteousness. You've become set free. From sin. This is what God has done for you. He says in, in, uh, in verse 1, he says, what should we say then? Should we go on sinning that grace may abound? Well, the idea was that, you know, grace covers sin. The more sin I commit, the more grace covers me. And grace is a good thing, isn't it? I mean, even we in the church will recognize that grace is a good thing. So the more we sin, the more grace we get. Just makes sense, doesn't it? So I can go on living the way I want to live. Now that's, that's a modern philosophy today. And we sing the song, just as I am, without one plea. We come just as we are. God will not allow us to stay that way. 
There's a transformation that needs to take place. There's a confirmation that needs to take place. Not confirmation, as we did in the Methodist Church when I was like 12 or 13 years old and I was confirmed as a member, okay? But conformation. Romans 8, 28 and 29, okay? That we become conformed to the image of God's Son. And so that needs to take place. And so Paul says, absolutely not. How can we who died to sin still live in it? How can we who have died to sin still live in it? Now look at verses 3 and 4. Do you not know that all of us who have been baptized into Christ Jesus have been baptized into His death? Therefore we've been buried with Him through baptism into death, so that as Christ was raised from the dead through the glory of the Father, so we too might walk in newness of life. So the people of Rome, these Christians in the church in Rome, they have done that. They died to sin. That's what Paul is saying. We died to sin. So how can we who have died to sin still live in it? Paul's perplexed by that, by the idea that, that sin is just is really no big deal. We've got that today, don't we? Carl Menninger, back in the 50s, he was a psychologist. And I don't think he was really a Christian. Um, he might have had some religious background, but he was not a Christian. He wasn't. He was not. And, um, and he wrote a book called Whatever Became of Sin. Just recognizing that in the psychological world. Whatever became of sin. And, and so we're living in that today where... You know, what is sin? Is anything really... And what are the consequences? Nothing. And think about this. I've had people tell me this. Adam and Eve sinned and nothing happened to them. In fact, in fact, what the serpent said was right. I said, is that so? Yes. God said, the day you eat of it, you will surely die. The serpent said, you're not going to die. They ate of it, and they didn't die. And what's more, God went looking for them, and He took care of them, and He gave them new clothes to wear. And I said, yes, all that's true. But they were expelled from His presence. For the remainder of their days. There was a flaming torch that passed across the entrance to the Garden of Eden where they used to walk with God in the cool of the day, barring their entrance with Him ever again. Their fellowship with God was forever shattered. Yeah, but God gave them a son to replace. Yep, He sure did. That's part of his overall purpose. I mean, from the very beginning, from 315, you remember what he said to the serpent? That's the first mention of Jesus in the Bible. I'll put enmity between you and the woman, between your seed and her seed. And so from that point on, he's carrying out his purpose of redemption. He had to replace Abel. And so he does with Seth. You read the rest of that. That's another, story. That's another lesson. But, but people who, who are saying, well, look at Adam and Eve. I mean, they sinned and God took care of them. Yep, he surely did. But they were forever banished from his presence. And there was a constant reminder that they were outside of his garden. And they had to work the land I mean, you preach that in West Texas where they have to work, you know. Although now they just ride in these great big combines and it's, I've ridden in those. It's, it's a lot of fun, but there's not a lot of hard work. <laughs> <clears throat> and in West Texas, I don't know if you know anything about West Texas, but when the farmers talk about coming around the, around the circle over here and coming up the hill, that kind of makes you nervous. Because there are no hills in West Texas. I mean, from West Texas all the way through Arizona, all the way to Flagstaff, Arizona, really, there's no, there's no hills. 
as flat as the eye can see. And they talk about that. Anyway, so you obey from the heart this pattern of teaching. It's a form or it's a standard of teaching. And I liken it to, um, well, you know, a lot of what I think about revolves around food. And no comments. He's already made comments this morning. Um, when we talk about, when we look at, um, for example, a bunt cake. Okay? You, you guys like bunt cakes? I do because when you cut them up, they're like handheld. I mean, oh, it's so easy, you know? But every time you use the same pan, what do you get? You get a cake that looks exactly the same every single time. Why? Because you're baking it in a form. It's a pattern. And every time you use that pattern, when women sew, or I don't know, any men in here sew? I don't. My mom taught me how, but once I got married, I gave up on that stuff. <clears throat> when, when people sew... You use a pattern to sew, and you can use the same pattern over and over and over again. And you get the same thing over and over and over again. So when you obey from the heart this pattern, every time you get the same thing. You get a slave of righteousness. Every time. What other patterns do we follow to become a slave of righteousness? What other pattern was handed down once for all now, see, I asked you to remind me about Jude verse 3, and nobody reminded me. I remembered that all on my own. Aren't you proud of me? Is that the third chapter? The third chapter of Jude, yes. Yeah. That's one of your elders saying that. <clears throat> um, if he got the third chapter of Jude and somebody said he's good, we ought to talk. But Jude was wanting to write to them about one thing, and he felt the need to write about something else, that they contend earnestly for the faith that was once for all handed down for all the saints. Is there anything else in our Bibles that was handed down to all the saints that describe how we're saved? Not exclusive of this pattern. Now there's other places. We go to John 10. This was one of my arguments mm, some 18 years ago. Is that Romans 10, 9 and 10 says all we have to do is believe and all we have to do is confess. And we're saved. That's what Romans 10, 9 and 10 tells us. If you believe and if you confess... You'll be saved, right? Isn't that what it says? So take that all by itself, and that's all you got, right? Okay? <clears throat> James chapter 2, verse 19, tells us you believe that God is one. Okay, now we were talking about believing the gospel, believing in God, and here James tells us you believe that God is one you do well. Now the idea of God being one, the Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit, God is one. You do well. Why? Well, even the demons believe that and they shudder. Okay? So take that. Go to Mark chapter 5. Now take somebody on this study with you, okay? And you go to Mark chapter 5 and you have uh, Jesus' encounter with the Gerasian demoniac. Okay? The man of Gerasa. Uh, or Gadara, depending on your translation, um, who lived among the swine and um, um, was gnashing his teeth. And I mean, he was just as mean as spit. And nobody could control him. They would chain him up and he'd break the chains. I mean, he was possessed by demons, right? Mm -hmm. Okay. So Jesus arrives on the scene. And before Jesus ever gets to him, this man comes running out to Jesus. And he says, what do we have to do with each other, Jesus, son of the most high God? Jesus says, well, who are you? He says, my name is Legion, for there are many. And then he says, please do not send us into the abyss, but send us into this herd of swine. I'm really paraphrasing this, all right? Read the, read the text. He sends them into the herd of swine. You know what happens. The herd of swine rushes down into the lake, all right? All right. 
So what have the demons just done? Do they believe? Sure do. What else did they do when they ran out to meet him? They confessed him. It's exactly what we do when we take somebody's confession before they're baptized. Do you believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God? Yes. Upon that confession, I now baptize you in the name of the Father. Right? Isn't that what we do? The demons did that. They believed and they confessed. Now they also acknowledged the authority of Jesus. They appealed to His authority when they said, Don't send us into the abyss, but send us into this herd of swine. They knew His ability. In fact, I'm not sure if it's Mark's account or if it's Luke's account. Um, one of them says, Have you come to torment us before the time? They knew there was a time when they were going to be tormented eternally. But that time hadn't come yet. The demons knew about that time. They all knew that every, all authority had been given to Jesus. They appealed to that authority in making their request. They confessed Him. They believed Him. Jesus, Son of the Most High God. So, if Romans 10, 9 and 10 is all that we need, we look forward to being in heaven with the demons. Am I right? Isn't that what Romans 10, 9 and 10 says? So what about this deal of obeying the gospel? If that's all we need. You see, it need, there needs to be a much broader discussion of salvation than just baptism. I mean, if, if all we do is get people through the water... We've done a disservice, and we've given them a false sense of hope. We've given them no more hope than the sinner's prayer gives. We talk about this pattern. Romans 6, um, verses 3 and 4, this pattern of death, burial, and resurrection. And he says that we have died. Um, all of us who have been baptized into Christ have been baptized into His death. We were therefore buried with Him through baptism. Now this is us. That's not Jesus. This is us. Or at least it's the Romans who have followed that pattern. And we're buried with Him through baptism into death so that as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, so we too may walk in newness of life. You see the pattern of a death, burial, and resurrection. But that pattern is played out in a body of water. Because that's what baptism means. A lot of people today talk about the modes of baptism. And there are not different modes of baptism. There are not, not different methods of baptizing people. Well, you baptize by immersion. We baptize by sprinkling. That's what we did in the Methodist church predominantly. Sometimes we'd use pouring. Other groups use pouring. But it's all baptism because it's all water. Sometimes a preacher or priest or somebody will dip their finger in water and just put a mark of a cross on a forehead and say that a person has been baptized. Is that what the Bible says? So when we talk about obeying the gospel and we talk about dying to Christ, being buried with Christ through baptism and being raised with Christ through the glory of the Father, we have to die, we have to be buried in something there's a burial. There's a going down in two. And that's what Philip did with the Ethiopian. Acts chapter 8. He, he goes down into the water. He baptized him. They come up out of the water. They're in the water. In fact, that's exactly what baptize means. It means to immerse or to plunge, to dip, to submerge, to make fully wet. These were some of the things that Stan was explaining to me some 18 years ago. Things I'd never thought of. We don't talk about this stuff. Not in the Methodist church. And so we're starting to talk about all of this. And there's a passage that he pointed out to me. I'll never forget it. It's Leviticus chapter 14, verses 15 and 16. Just remember Leviticus 14, 15, 16. It's that easy. 
Okay? But he talks about the priests who would take oil and they would pour it into their hand. Okay? Now, in the Septuagint, the word for pour is kao. And then they would dip, baptiza, their finger, and they would sprinkle, rantizo, this oil. Okay? So one of the things you learn is that pouring and sprinkling and baptizing all have different terms. Pouring is not sprinkling. Sprinkling is not immersing. Immersing is not pouring. You see what I'm saying? You can't use that. So how do we get the word baptize? You guys know this, don't you? When the King James Version of the Bible was translated, the king had never been immersed. He had only been sprinkled. So the translators couldn't, in good conscience, translate Acts 2.38, Repent and let every one of you be sprinkled, because that's not the meaning of the word baptiza. Their intellectual credibility would have been shattered had they done that. So they transliterate the word instead of <coughs> translating it. And so we, got, we took baptizma and got baptism. That's how we got it. From the authorized version. Now, I'm not, don't, don't knock me for being overly critical of the King James, all right? I'm just telling you that's where we get the word. It does not mean, it cannot mean, it cannot be pictured as pouring or sprinkling because the word doesn't mean that. Peter did not say, repent and let every one of you be poured. Because you can't pour anybody. You can't sprinkle anybody. But you can baptize everybody. So think about that. Understand what baptism really is. It's not a mode by which we're baptized. It is, immersion is baptism. That's just pure definition of the term. Oh, there's some history that begins with the Didache back in the maybe the late first century, but second century where the, a departure from this pattern begins to emerge. You guys, you want all that history? You want to talk about Carthage and Cyprian and Novation, the Council of Nemort? You guys can look at that. But eventually it led in about 1300, somewhere in there, that sprinkling or pouring was just as viable an option as immersing. And it still doesn't mean what it says. So Romans 6, you're baptized into Christ's death. Your old self is crucified with Christ. This is the pattern that they're following, right? You're buried with Christ through baptism, verse 4. You're raised with Christ from the dead to walk in newness of life. I mean, it's a picture of Jesus in the tomb and the tomb being empty on the third day. You come up out of the water, you walk up the steps out of the baptistry, and it's empty. You're not there anymore, are you? Well, it was the same way on the third day when the women arrived early at the tomb. They arrived at the tomb, and there was not a body there. And when you rise up from the water, there's not a body left there. A lot of sin left in there. But there's no body. Because we're raised up. And then he says, now here's verse 5. This is the verse that did it. This is what knocked me off my feet. The NIV, the 1984 edition of the NIV, says, For if we have been united with him like this, we will certainly be united with him in the resurrection. Like this. You know how I was united with Christ? I asked him into my heart. It's what I did. And I believe that I was saved. Because I asked him into my heart. I believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God. I, oh, I believe. I believe John 20, 31 with all my heart. I believe that. And I asked him to come in. I asked him to forgive me of all my sin. I asked him to make me a Christian. Because that's what a preacher told me to do. I took his word for it. I did it. 
And then some little guy that sat down next to me instead of Reggie White told me to look at Romans chapter 6. Knock me off my feet. Because Paul says, if we have been united with him like this, there is certainty. What if we've not been united like that? I was united with him by saying a sinner's prayer. Hmm. You know what I came to realize? Sat up right in bed one night. My wife and I were going to bed and was on my mind. We'd been thinking about it, praying about it, talking about it. And I sat up in bed and I said, I don't think we're Christians. It was hard. Because I'm a preacher. I, there was a sign outside the front of the church building. When we first moved there, they, they put this brand new sign in. The old sign was rotten and fallen down. They put in a brand new sign, and right on the bottom of it, it said, Reverend Kevin Schweiger. Oh, I like that. I, I mean, that filled my ego pretty well. We started studying and came across Psalm 111 in verse 9. I said, look, I said, holy and reverend is his name. Not mine. Don't put reverend by my name. I said, can we change that? And so we did, and it read, Pastor Kevin Schweiger. <laughs> and I thought, that's me. What do you mean I'm not a Christian? What, Kevin, what are you thinking? Kelly says, well, why not? I said, because we haven't been united with him like this. So I don't think we're really united with him. I haven't obeyed from the heart that form, that pattern of teaching. I need to be committed to that. I need to obey that. Because that's the gospel, 1 Corinthians chapter 15. And for the first time in my life, obeying the gospel was making sense. The pieces were coming together. I don't know what I'd have done, where I'd be. I don't know who I'd be. That little guy with the comb over hadn't sat down next to me and explained it. I may still be lost outside of Christ, maybe thinking that I'm right, sincerely believing that, but being sincerely wrong. That's, and that's, so when I talk about not questioning somebody's sincerity, that's what I mean. Because a person can be sincere and yet sincerely wrong. I like to think that I was sincere. Carrie always talks about a sincere heart. Well, I hope so. I just hope it, it's a heart that's always open to what the Bible says. And so as you're studying with somebody, isn't that the heart you'd like to have? Isn't that, isn't that your heart? Does that describe your heart? What would you do with Romans chapter 6? I'd have to obey it. Bingo. You see, this is what Chuck and I were talking about. Evangelism is not rocket science. We've complicated it so much. It's as simple as, as believing and obeying the gospel and unpacking that for those who think a little bit differently than we do. Who maybe they use instruments in their worship. So be it. Who maybe only take the Lord's Supper once every quarter. So be it. When they come to know Christ and to know this pattern, they'll begin to see the pattern of the church. They'll begin to learn some things. When I, when I first obeyed the gospel, I, I kind of looked at instrumental music as just our choice. That's, that was our preference. That's how we chose to worship, was a cappella without instruments. I just thought that's what, you know, and so there was no big deal if somebody else 
wanted to use them. It's not that big. Well, I didn't realize until I started getting into the scriptures that that's conviction, not preference. But Stan allowed me the time to develop that understanding. And he led me all the way. Bottom line, when you obey from the heart that pattern of teaching, you're freed from sin. <laughs> That's the greatest thing anybody can ever know. One is to know the guilt of sin. And to know that if while you're still in sin, that you face the vengeance, the retribution, the judgment, the wrath of God. And when you obey the gospel, you get to experience the grace and the mercy of God. Well, Luke gives us at least nine examples of people who obeyed from the heart this form of teaching. So for the next hour, we'll look at those. You look at the examples of the book of Acts, and you understand that this pattern is what has always produced Christians. There is no other pattern. There is no other teaching. There is no other method. There is no other mode. There is no other form. This, this is the faith that was once for all handed down for all the saints. This, <coughs> Ephesians chapter 2, this is the foundation that was laid by the apostles, the foundation for the church. This is it. This is the foundation of the church. And so every person who obeys from the heart this form of teaching, as Peter says, becomes a living stone and is built into the church, the body of Christ, built upon that foundation that was laid by the apostles. Oh, there's so much more that we can say about the gospel. Let me say two things, and then I'm done. I didn't say how long those two things would take, but I just said, let me say two things. The gospel changes the way we think. Okay? It changes the way we think about, well, the gospel. It changes the way we think about God's tolerance and God's patience. It changes the way we think about ourselves and about others. I hope it does. It should, especially for those who have not obeyed. But then it also changes the way we walk. If the gospel does not change the way we live our lives, then we may very well be living in Romans 6, 1 and 2, rather than verse 3, 4 and 5. If it doesn't change the way we live. I say this all the time. This is the last thought. You'll never change the way you live until you change the way you think. And there's no greater catalyst for changing our thinking than the gospel itself. Thank you guys for allowing me to be here again. Appreciate you all.